Now, what possesses a national leader such as Vladimir Putin to invade a sovereign country, bomb its assets and now its people, and become the pariah of the world? Russia was always going to try and expand. And this is what people in the West really don't understand is this isn't about NATO being aggressive, mm. causing it. It's the West being weak that's mm. causing it. And there had been before then the promise uh, by James Baker, who was Secretary of State under the administration of George H.W. Bush, that NATO wouldn't move one inch eastward. Now, when Trump became president, though, well, Putin did not make another move. Also, the 2014 coup that the United States pushed and then installed uh, a government that is infiltrated with neo-Nazis. He's clearly unhinged, and it seems to me, he's, I mean, he, he's a total psychopath. Uh, well, Putin hasn't talked to me in weeks, so I have no idea what's <laughs> in his head. Hello, everyone. You've just heard a selection of different perspectives on Vladimir Putin and his recent invasion of Ukraine. I want to examine the very first question posed in these clips. What does possess a national leader such as Putin to invade a sovereign country? Can his motives be written off as madness, requiring no further investigation? Is he a megalomaniac, intent on re-establishing the Russian Empire, going down in history as Tsar Vladimir the Great? Or is this all part of a global communist conspiracy? The old octopus spreading its tentacles across the world once more. Some commentators blame this crisis on the weakness of Western democracies. If only we had a strong man like Donald Trump in charge, Putin wouldn't have dared make this move. Others also blame the West, but for different reasons. Whilst not necessarily excusing Putin from the immediate aggressive act, they suggest that some shenanigans have gone on with NATO's expansion into the East. They further point to the overthrow of various Ukrainian governments and throw modern day Nazis into the mix too. The final opening clip was of journalist Greg Palast, joking that Putin hasn't talked to him in weeks, so he's no idea what his plans are. A lot of media figures, who I'm going to guess don't know that much about Russia, Putin or the Ukraine, are talking as if they're inside the Russian president's head. From this position, they are able to both explain his motives and diagnose his psychopathology at the same time. Such speculation is fine as far as it goes, but what I find more valuable is to understand the historical context in which the conflict arises. In this podcast, I will therefore be running over the past approximately 100 years of this history hopefully explaining where the conflicting Ukrainian and Russian points of view emerge from. The concept of a Ukrainian nation emerged in the middle of the 18th century. Towards the end of that century, Empress Catherine the Great annexed the majority of what is now Ukraine into Russia. At the same time, the Western provinces became a part of the Austrian Empire. Successive Russian governments, fearing Ukrainian separatists, cracked down on intellectuals and banned the use of the Ukrainian language. This situation remained relatively stable until 1917, when in the chaos of the World War and Russian Revolution, Ukrainians moved to establish their independence. The War of Independence of 1917-21 temporarily produced the Free Territory of Ukraine, with Lenin's Soviet Union ultimately recapturing the country. This takes us into a pivotal point in Russian-Ukrainian relations, and one of the darkest parts of modern European history, the genocide known as the Holodomor. To tell this story, I've edited together some clips from the documentary film Harvest of Despair. The year 1933, the place, the Soviet Union. Behind the facade, Food is being used as a weapon against peoples who have proven troublesome to Moscow. Famine is engineered deliberately in the North Caucasus, the Volga Basin, and Ukraine. The Soviet secret police seal off Ukraine's borders. No one can get out or bring food in. A nation the size of France is strangled by hunger. In less than two years, 
10 million people die. 7 million of them in Ukraine. 3 million of them children. The untold story of Ukraine's darkest tragedy begins at a time of great optimism and joy in March 1917. A tidal wave of revolution sweeps aside the mighty Tsarist Empire. National boundaries change rapidly with the dramatic shifting of power. Ukrainians grasp the chance to reclaim their independence after 200 years of Russian domination. Kiev, Ukraine's ancient capital, is once again the seat of government. Ukraine's rich and fertile land has supplied Europe with grain for countless generations. Even the ancient Greeks depended on her abundant stores of wheat. History has taught Ukraine that freedom has a price. The people prepare to defend their national republic against all invaders. December 1917. Having consolidated Bolshevik control in Russia, Lenin prepares to reclaim the former Tsarist territories. Ensuing years of chaos, Ukrainians fight Lenin's Red Army, Denikin's White Army, Germans, Poles. Whether the armies march in as enemies or allies, the price is always measured in tons of food. This bountiful country is slowly bled dry. 1921, the dust of battle finally settles. Russia has retaken the major part of the country. Western Ukraine is carved up between Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. The Soviet conquerors ship out more and more grain to feed Moscow. A drought adds to Ukraine's misery. Millions die as the breadbasket of Europe experiences its first famine. Yet this is but a preview of the tragedy to follow. To end the continued resistance to Bolshevik rule, Lenin adopts a new economic policy Grain requisitions are cancelled. The peasant farmer is allowed to trade freely on the open market. The impact on Ukraine is dynamic. 80% of her population are farmers. Hoping to win further support, Lenin tolerates the national revival which has been gathering momentum since the 1917 revolution in Kiev. Ukraine's blossoming renaissance is so powerful, Lenin's successor, Stalin, views the loss of Russian influence with increasing alarm. Thousands of Ukrainian language parishes spring up across the country. For the first time since the 17th century, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church re-establishes its independence from the Moscow Patriarchate. In the arts, the flourishing avant-garde models itself on Western, not Russian, culture. Literary circles abound. Writers and poets develop a uniquely Ukrainian literature. Ukraine's leading communist writer, Nikola Khmylyovay, elaborates on the dangerous slogan, Away from Moscow. 
Even the leader of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Nikola Skripnik, sees the USSR as a kind of League of Nations and argues for greater cultural and political autonomy to win Ukrainians over to communism. By 1928, Stalin is a law unto himself. This efficient, ruthless administrator has eliminated all effective opposition within the Politburo. The dream of a worldwide communist revolution has not materialized. As Stalin strengthens communism within the borders of the USSR, Russian nationalism is increasingly injected into his policies. The strong cultural individuality of Ukraine is no longer tolerated. 1929, Stalin strikes at the nation's heart and mind, its church and intelligentsia. Over the next few years, the systematic liquidation of intellectuals is carried out by the communist regime in Ukraine. 5,000 scholars, scientists, poets and artists prominent during Ukraine's independence are arrested for allegedly belonging to the SVU, a secret organization the Soviets claim is planning an armed insurrection. Only 45 get a public trial. No evidence is considered necessary. Thousands upon thousands are imprisoned, deported, and executed later as mass arrests continue throughout the 30s. Even the church is accused of involvement in this alleged plot. By 1930, only the Russian Orthodox Church remains. In October 1928, Stalin introduces a drastic five-year plan to transform the Soviet Union from a backward rural society into a modern, self-sufficient industrial empire, virtually overnight. Military defense takes priority. Socialism must be protected from all future enemies. Western technology is urgently needed. To pay for it, Stalin must seize the only exportable resource, grain. And so he decrees the compulsory collectivization of agriculture. Henceforth, all private lands, livestock and farming implements will belong to the state. The farmer will work as a laborer for pay, like a worker in a factory. With the destruction of the intellectuals and the church well underway, collectivization allows Stalin to break the farmers, the backbone of the nation. Anticipating fierce resistance, he orders the liquidation of the kulaks as a class. Kulak is a Bolshevik label for the wealthier farmers who own 24 acres of land or hire labor. They are considered the potential leaders in any revolt. The state confiscates not only the lands of the farmers, classified as kulaks, but also all their possessions. It is forbidden by law to assist these enemies of the people. Some farmers burn their crops, kill their livestock, and flee to the cities. But over the next three years, one million men, women, and children are rounded up jammed into sealed boxcars and shipped off to the remotest corners of the Soviet Union. The survivors work as slave labor, producing raw materials for export to the West. This is the end of the line for many of the best farmers and cultural and religious leaders of Ukraine. The wheat is left standing in the fields. The demoralized farmers respond to the ruinous taxes and the presence of troops by simply refusing to work. The grain quotas or taxes are deliberately raised to exceed what the individual farmers can possibly produce. Either they join the collectives where the taxes are three times lower 
or face exile as kulaks. By mid-1932, three quarters of all Ukrainian farms are collectivized. Then, in August, crippling new quotas are levied on the collectives themselves. Another exorbitant quota is levied in October, and yet another at the beginning of the new year. These levies are impossible to meet. The regime blames the farmers for the stringent food rationing in the cities. In reality, the Soviets are dumping tons of wheat on Western markets. The 1932 harvest yields enough grain to have fed the entire population of Ukraine for two years. Instead, famine ravages the country. Half a world away, kinsmen of the famine victims voice protests and form relief committees. Help is offered from Canada, the United States, Switzerland, France, Belgium. Cardinal Initzer initiates relief in Austria. Metropolitan Sheptitsky in western Ukraine. But all shipments of food grind to a halt at the Soviet border. The Soviet Red Cross flatly denies the existence of famine. The hands of the international organization are tied. Spring 1933, the man-made famine reaches its height. 25,000 are dying every day, 1,000 an hour, 17 human beings every minute. Stalin ends the famine with a single decree. Having broken the Ukrainian farmers, he can afford to give out grain on the collectives during the harvest in 1933. 1934, purges take place in the cities and mark the end of Ukrainian participation in the running of their country. 27,000 Ukrainian communists are arrested and replaced by Russians. Only 36 out of 259 Ukrainian writers survive as the terror intensifies. The jail cells are rapidly emptied as Ukrainian nationalism becomes an offense punishable by death. So once again, that was the documentary Harvest of Despair. I've only used excerpts of the narrator here. The full film contains interviews with Ukrainians who lived through the genocide. Some of those that did, although extremely old now, will still be alive today. It's quite tragic to think after all they've lived through, both Stalin and Hitler's occupations, at the end of their lives they are witnessing their country slide into war with Russia once more. As a side note, elements in the Western press colluded to cover up the Holodomor as it was going on. The New York Times was especially guilty, even refusing to return the Pulitzer Prize won by its journalist once the truth came out. There were a couple of reasons for this. For one, business interests in the United States were looking to normalize relations with the Soviet Union at that time. Additionally, certain Western intellectuals had an ideological commitment to what they thought of as a planned society. They therefore could not or would not admit it had all gone so horribly wrong. The far-right Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists was founded in Vienna in 1929. It sought to infiltrate universities and political structures, as well as employing terrorist tactics, all for the goal of bringing about an independent Ukraine. In 1939, the Second World War began with Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin invading Poland. Nazi Germany then invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. The Ukrainian response was mixed. Some elements of the nationalist underground formed a Ukrainian insurgent army that fought both Soviet and Nazi forces. Others collaborated with the Nazis, believing they would respect an independent Ukrainian state. The act of proclamation of Ukrainian statehood declares that the organization of Ukrainian nationalists would work closely with the National Socialist Greater Germany, under the leadership of its leader Adolf Hitler, 
which is forming a new order in Europe and the world and is helping the Ukrainian people to free itself from the Moscovite occupation. The Nazis, however, had no intention of doing any such thing, and as relations soured they moved to detain and liquidate hostile members of the Ukrainian resistance. The western provinces of Ukraine, which had been held by the Austrian Empire, were now a part of Poland. Ukrainians there were also subject to efforts to suppress their language and culture. Extreme factions within the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalist Military Wing, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, proceeded to ethnically cleanse the land by massacring 100,000 Polish civilians. The strategy was that if there were no Poles on the land, then there would be no one to oppose a Ukrainian state there after the war. Here's the crux of the issue today. Whilst many in the Ukrainian insurgent army were disgusted by the massacre, the leader of the extremist faction that carried it out, Stepan Bandera, is revered in Western Ukraine today. Bandera was a prisoner of the Nazis at the time of the atrocity, and therefore may not have been directly responsible, but it's still a strange sight to see many people parading through the streets in his honour. From their perspective, he's a nationalist hero. In 2010, then-President Viktor Yushchenko posthumously awarded Bandera the title of Hero of Ukraine, in a move criticised by both the European Parliament and the Russian government. Bandera's popularity as a figurehead has grown considerably since the 2014 revolution. Stepan Hural is 90 now. At the age of 15, he joined the ranks of the Ukrainian insurgent army and fought for independent Ukraine, which seemed to be a dream back in 1943. I suffered cerebral contusion. Two meters of soil covered me. Not only me. There were many of us. And two guys did not survive. Stepan Hural remembers how the independence of Ukraine was proclaimed in Lviv on June 30, 1941. There was an attempt to establish a state. The Ukrainian state was proclaimed in Lviv, here near the Opera House. It was like a rebirth from under the ground. I thank God that he allowed me to live to this day and honor the memory of Stepan Bandera. Those ideas that were established by him at that time will exist for a very long time. Stepan Bandera was one of the authors of the Ukrainian State Restoration Act. Historians consider its proclamation in June 1941 to be a great step towards the independence of Ukraine. Stepan Bandera said that the words glory to Ukraine would be heard from Galicia to the east. And we now hear that the Ukrainian military say glory to Ukraine in all cities. Bandera fought for our great United State. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists, headed by Stepan Bandera, developed its network and started the liberation movement of Ukraine. He is a symbol of the nation, a person who gave his life for Ukrainians. And it's our duty to honor his memory every year. The Lviv Regional Council declared 2019 as the year of Stepan Bandera and the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Reported by Yulia Bil, UATV. The Russians lost 27 million people fighting the Nazis. So, unsurprisingly, they are rather sensitive to militarized groups employing fascist symbolism in a neighboring country. I'll return to this point when we get closer to the modern day. As an aside, the major architect of the massacre of the Poles, Mykola Lebed, emigrated to the United States where he lived in New York City till his death in 1998. The CIA employed him for intelligence gathering on the Soviet Union whilst protecting him from prosecution. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, over 90% of Ukrainian citizens voted for independence, with majorities in every region even the ones that now want to secede or join Russia. The Ukrainian economy initially suffered similar hardships to the Russian one, shrinking by more than 10% per year. I'll come back to this point in just a minute. Listening to Vladimir Putin's speech, where he explained his reasons for going to war, one of the things he is clearly very angry about is the eastward expansion of NATO. When the USSR dissolved, as a condition for allowing the reunification of Germany, 
Mikhail Gorbachev sought and received assurances that NATO would move not one inch to the east. This was of paramount importance to the Russians, as twice in the space of 25 years, German armies had marched into their country, with on the latter occasion, as I've mentioned, it taking 27 million Russian lives to stop them. They're not convinced that history is now over and something akin to this won't ever happen again. The NATO alliance subsequently incorporated Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Albania, Croatia, and most recently, Montenegro and North Macedonia. NATO further recognises the right of three aspiring countries, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia and Ukraine, to join the alliance at a future point. You may think NATO is a defensive alliance and such a war is not likely. Depending on how you count it, however, NATO has fought four wars, all of them aggressive. The invasion of Afghanistan was justified by security concerns post 9-11, whilst Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo and Libya were justified as humanitarian interventions. These are of course the exact same reasons Putin is citing to justify his invasion. Whilst a World War II style ground invasion is unlikely given the existence of nuclear weapons, NATO's move east makes unilateral disarmament, a real talking point in the 1980s, utterly impossible now. Unlike the consumers of Western state and corporate media, the Russian government does not see the United States foreign policy as being about exporting freedom and democracy around the world. Rather, they will see it in the altogether more accurate light of extending corporate and imperial power. Any cursory glance at history confirms this to be completely true. The United States has consistently destroyed countries in order to bring them into its imperial orbit, and NATO is simply one of many tools for carrying this out. It is true that Ukraine is unlikely to gain NATO membership anytime soon. Not wanting to be dragged into a war with Russia, various European countries would block them from joining. It is also the case, however, that they are becoming de facto members, with vast amounts of US military equipment and training poured into the country. Ukraine is a red line due to its size, position, and the fact that the Russian fleet anchors in Crimea. Returning to the economic situation in the post-Soviet bloc, Russians experienced an economic downturn reckoned to be worse than what the US had experienced during the Great Depression. The GDP fell by more than 40%. Hyperinflation wiped out personal savings. There was a huge surge in crime and destitution, a rise in inequality, and a decrease in life expectancy. Whilst Russia obviously had plenty of homegrown corruption and criminality, the real kicker here is that a lot of this collapse was engineered by economic advisors brought in by Boris Yeltsin from the United States. This is a huge subject to go into. I'll just play a clip of a recent interview conducted by anti-war radio Scott Horton with former Wall Street Journal reporter Anne Williamson. Miss Williamson testified before the Committee on Banking and Financial Services of the US House of Representatives on the rape of Russia and offered a book on this episode that no U.S. publishing house would touch. So in other and, words, Anne, and yeah. do, do I have you right that it's not that they were really just trying to kick Russia while they were down and destroy their economy. It was just that they're Democrats. And so they're neoliberals, not libertarians. They don't really understand market economics the way yeah. say, an Austrian school or even a Chicago school guy does. No, they're, no, they're not Austrians, not even close. Uh, they themselves are favorites in our system. Uh, but they were they trying to destroy Russia? Yeah, to a degree they were. They wanted to keep Russia down. The idea was they understood that the privatization scheme they'd come up with was mostly thievery. And, but they didn't care. They would tell me, well, look, let them steal. It doesn't matter. They're not going to be able to operate these huge state enterprises. And they'll want to cash in. So they'll sell out to us cheap. That was the idea. 
Mm-hmm. Go ahead and let them flounder around, and then you go in and buy up the assets at a very attractive price and start claiming those cash flows, particularly from the extractive uh, sector of the economy, gas, oil, gold, mm-hmm. minerals. In other words, so their, their Keynesian economic you know, crackpot theories were played a minor role compared to one, their opportunism, and two, in a sense, their imperialism and their willingness to punish Russia and take advantage of their new weakened position and make them weaker. Yeah, and uh, I think the United States government was very much in favor of that. Another pivotal event took place in Ukraine in 2004. The incumbent prime minister, Viktor Yanukovych, who supported closer ties of Russia, ran for the presidency against opposition candidate Viktor Yushchenko. Yushchenko wanted Ukraine to turn its attention westwards and aim to eventually join the European Union. Yanukovych officially won the election, but Yushchenko and his supporters alleged that vote rigging and intimidation cost him many votes, especially in eastern Ukraine. A political crisis erupted after the opposition started massive street protests centred around the Maidan Square. It seems overwhelmingly likely that Yanukovych, already a convicted criminal, did engage in electoral fraud. In what became known as the Orange Revolution, the Supreme Court of Ukraine ordered the election results null and void, and a second runoff found Viktor Yushchenko the winner. This was undoubtedly in many ways a protest from the ground up, with 500,000 people assembling in Kiev. They utilised the teachings of Jean Sharp's book, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, and the protests were overwhelmingly peaceful. It's really quite inspiring given what's currently going on with lockdown and medical mandate protests taking place around the globe. To say that the protests were entirely from the ground up, however, would not be true. Activists received tens of millions in funding from the United States, being sponsored by such groups as the National Democratic Institute, the US State Department, US Aid, Freedom House, and George Soros's Open Society Institute. Events in Kiev came soon after similar tactics unseated Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia and Eduard Shevardnadze in Georgia with a failed attempt to oust Alexander Lukashenko in Belarus. Let's listen to a clip from the 2011 documentary, The Revolution Business. So are all of these revolutions actually initiated by the Americans? We can look back at what happened during the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine for evidence. The events that took place in Kiev in 2005 appear to endorse this assumption. Traditionally, Ukraine was part of Russia, but by the end of 2004, the tide had turned. The United States pumped millions of dollars into the opposition movements in favor of regime change. We are meeting with the two former leaders of the Ukraine Revolution. Just by being a member of the opposition movement PORA, they received significant sums of money, together with training in civil disobedience. Finally, they were given the book. Oh yes, the book by Gene Sharp. We all used it, and it connected us with everybody, with Otpor in Serbia, the opposition movement in Belarus, and Kamara in Georgia. It was in November 2004 when hundreds of thousands of people flooded Independence Square in Kiev and demanded Viktor Yushchenko for their president. At the end of the revolution, the crowd got what they demanded. Yushchenko became president due to the massive support he received from the Western world. We had a number of uh, great examples of uh, uh, dramatizing uh, as well as uh, having fun on the streets. The revolution is a celebration. This is the spirit of Gene Sharp. Every movement becomes a brand with its own symbolism. Oranges in Ukraine, the Rose Revolution in Georgia, the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the Denim Revolution in Belarus. All different symbols, but with the same concept and the same sponsor, the United States of America. In my case, in 2004, I was heading a water education campaign with budget of one million bucks. 
One million dollars? Yeah. Yes. But it's not because uh, American taxpayers wanted to protest Yanukovych, but because uh, Yanukovych tried to steal the world. The United States and the European Union and others, they are serious about democracy. Whilst Yanukovych may have stolen the election, there is nothing in the history of US regime change operations that indicates they are, as the Ukrainian activist says, interested in democracy. Quite the opposite. The United States has spent decades opposing democratic movements in favour of compliant dictatorships. Indeed, just prior to that clip in the documentary, geopolitical analyst F. William Engerdahl states, What Mr. Sharp one time called non-violence as a method of warfare. And they are going in every place since the end of the Cold War to destabilize regimes which offer resistance to this larger agenda, the globalization agenda as Washington defines it. Moving on to 2013, this is where the current conflict in Ukraine has its immediate origin. In spite of the Supreme Court ruling that election fraud had taken place in 2004, no one was ever convicted of anything. Viktor Yanukovych actually continued his political career working as Prime Minister before being elected President in 2010. Bizarre, but true. Yanukovych began jailing members of the former regime, including his now major political rival, Yulia Tymoshenko. The European Union, United States, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and even Russia expressed concern that the charges were politically motivated. In November of 2013, President Yanukovych performed a last-minute U-turn and did not sign the Ukraine-European Union Association Agreement, instead opting to pursue closer ties with Russia. Whatever the virtues or vices of this decision, it was incredibly unpopular in the west of the country, sparking massive protests. Over 100,000 people again took to the streets in Kiev. Now we have the first of several incidents that spark the breakdown into war. It's conclusive that snipers who were not a part of the regular Ukrainian security forces were operating in the Badan Square. They were shooting both police and protesters and killed around 50 people. This is something media organizations as diverse as the BBC and Russia Today agree upon. What no one agrees upon is who they were working for. Henedai Moscow, a former deputy head of Ukraine's main security agency, suggested that the snipers were agents of the state, looking to escalate the conflict in order to justify the police operation to clear the Medan. On the other hand, there exists video of right-wing nationalists carrying cases of what they claim to be musical instruments out of the Medan Square immediately after the shootings. I'll play a clip of journalist Aaron Matei making the case for the logic of this position. And by the way, the Russian spokesperson mentioned the Maidan massacre. This was a very, very key event. There was a, after months of protests in the Maidan in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, by the way, it started out, a large part of those protests were legitimate. They were protesting a corrupt government, Yanukovych, and they were calling for democratic reforms. There's a lot to admire about what they did. But the problem is, as happens often, those protests got co-opted by far-right Nazi forces who turned it into a bid for violent regime change. And the zenith of that was when, to resolve the Maidan protests, to resolve the crisis, there was a negotiated settlement reached, brokered by European countries, in which the president, Yanukovych, would agree to new elections very, very soon and have curtailed powers. That was agreed with the opposition. The opposition leaders went back to the Maidan and met with the far-right leaders who told them, what the hell are you doing? We're not going to make an agreement with this guy. We want him out. And shortly after that, there was, as the spokesperson mentioned, a massacre of protests in Maidan. Snipers killing people, a lot of people. It was blamed on the Yanukovych government. And that then led to a series of uh, uh, more violent action that basically forced Yanukovych to flee. And that agreement that would have resolved this crisis was killed. The U.S., by the way, cheered when, when uh, Yanukovych fled. It turns out uh, there's been research done by a political scientist, Ukrainian, at the University of Ottawa named Ivan Kachanovsky, based on forensic evidence 
videos, speaking to witnesses that shows pretty conclusively, and I'll tweet this out after this interview, that the shooting of these Maidan protesters came from a Maidan far-right fascist controlled area, that they were the ones killing their own people to try to spark an event that could lead to a violent overthrow of the government, and that's exactly what happened. As with the 2004 coup, the United States worked behind the scenes. State Department official Victoria Newland was, embarrassingly, caught on tape planning the next government as if Ukraine were a U.S. colony. Now, Victoria Newland is strongly in favor of war with Russia. What's amazing is that anyone, anywhere, is still listening to her. No serious person could take Victoria Newland seriously. She's a joke. Not only is she obviously unimpressive as a person, ask anyone who knows her, and she's not especially pro-American, by the way, she was one of the architects of the disaster in Iraq. So why is Toria Newland still talking about foreign policy? Is the guy who designed Chernobyl still building nuclear reactors? Probably not. Only in Washington, where failure is assiduously rewarded, could someone like Victoria Newland still wield power, which she absolutely does. It's scary when you think about it. Toria Newland is driving our Ukraine policy, which of course is being justified by our broader support for, quote, democracy. Now keep that in mind as you listen to this. This is the same, the same Toria Newland who was caught on tape several years ago scheming about how to end democracy in Ukraine. Here's Newland in a leaked audio recording plotting the overthrow of Ukraine's democratically elected president. Listen as Newland rattles off a list of potential puppets to install in place of the democratically elected I president. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. It's just not going to work. What about the voters of Ukraine who thought they were engaged in democracy? Nope, there's Tory Newland working to overthrow democracy. Keep in mind, if they'll do it there, they will do it here. You're hearing the same State Department goon who worked to organize a coup in Ukraine telling us we need to go to war with Russia to preserve democracy in Ukraine. These people have no shame. At this point, the Ukrainian parliament voted to relieve Yanukovych off duty. An interim government was established, which interestingly saw Arseniy Yatsenyuk become prime minister. I say interestingly because that's exactly who Victoria Nuland selected for the job in the recorded phone call. It's at this point Vladimir Putin decides to annex Crimea. He later gave a humanitarian intervention-based reason for doing so, stating, How could we say no to Sevastopol and Crimea? To the people who live there. How could we not take them under our protection, under our wing? Impossible. We were put in a situation where we could not do otherwise. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoyu later said, if all these people, Ukrainian neo-fascists, ultra-nationalists, extremists and mercenaries from European countries and the United States, had come to Crimea after the coup in Kiev, as they were about to do, I assure you, no one would have thought any less. The Russian government claims then that Ukraine had been subject to a US-backed fascist coup. Russia then needed to protect Russian people in the Ukraine, as well as its vital security interests. At the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Russia had drawn up security agreements with Ukraine, which allowed them to anchor their fleet in Crimea. As an aside, another aspect of this was the Ukraine transferring its nuclear weapons to Russia in exchange for a security agreement. Russia formally annexed Crimea on the 18th of March 2014. A referendum showed over 95% of Crimea's citizens wanted to rejoin Russia. The Ukrainian government, the European Union and the United States all rejected its legitimacy, as the constitution of the Ukraine states Alteration to the territory of the Ukraine shall be resolved exclusively by an all-Ukrainian referendum. In other words, any particular part requires the permission of the whole to secede. In April of 2014, separatists proclaimed the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic and held referendums on the 11th of May. 
the separatists claimed nearly 90% voted in favour of independence. Just prior to this vote being held, there was a massacre in Odessa, where, amongst other violence, it seems overwhelmingly conclusive that far-right nationalists burned 39 anti-government activists to death. Here's an eyewitness account from Russia Today. Around 6 p.m. people gathered in the center of the city to watch Russian TV channels. And then somebody said that armed men are approaching. Women and children hid in the trade union's building. First, the armed men set fire to tents, then started throwing Molotov cocktails and grenades at the building. We heard shots fired, saw thick smoke. Women leaned out of windows to let a breeze in. When I left the site, there were around 50 people on the roof, and the building was surrounded by aggressive radicals. I said it seems conclusive, because in spite of videos of Molotov cocktails being thrown at the building, I was surprised when reading about this to see Western media outlets suggesting blame could not be conclusively attributed. Apparently I wasn't the only one to notice this. Despite video witness reports and radical nationalists boasts about being behind the blaze, the Western mainstream media has been careful to stay ambiguous. And as RT's Guy and can report, some news outlets say they still don't know how the deadly fire started. In U.S. and European media, we've seen and heard some very carefully worded commentary on the tragedy that happened in Odessa, carefully as to avoid assigning blame to those who have actually set the building on fire and torched all these people inside. Watching their material, you may get a sense that the building just caught fire, just like that. And the anti-Kiev protest camp that had been set up in front of the building happened to have been destroyed earlier. And it all just happened. Clashes between the pro-Ukrainian camp and the pro-Russian camp killed at least four people at the onset. Then a fire breaking out in a building there. Unclear exactly what may have caused it. Meanwhile, down here in the south where I am in Odessa, this is the first real violence we have seen here. This has been a peaceful city so far. At some stage yesterday, and it's still unclear exactly how this started, but there were rival pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian protests here. It led to fierce street clashes which culminated in a huge fire here in a building last night. The Violence is escalating in Ukraine. Police in normally calm Odessa say a clash between pro-Russians and government supporters led to a fire that killed at least 31 people. Well, we've seen footage which clearly shows pro-Kiev activists throwing Molotov cocktails into the burning building with people trapped inside. And you have right sector activists who admit having done that. And yet, it seems all we see is an attempt to whitewash their actions. Here's Washington Post writing, a pro-Ukrainian activist said our people had thrown the Molotov cocktail, but now they're helping them to escape the building. Then you have many carefully worded headlines again, as if the fire just happened. The New York Times goes, 46 people, 46 people had died. Many of the dead were pro-Russia militants who had retreated into a trade union building that was then set on fire. The words pro-Russian militants can create an impression that those were not just people, not just anti-Kiev demonstrators who were trapped inside a burning building, but militants. And that kind of wording can almost justify the act of killing. The Guardian quotes a member of the extreme nationalist group Right Sector saying, the aim is to completely clear Odessa. They are all paid Russian separatists. That gives you an idea of the level of intolerance among the groups that brought the current government in Kiev to power. There's this narrative perpetuated here that everyone in Ukraine who opposes the government in Kiev and who feels strong ties with Russia is simply controlled by Moscow. And that narrative is in line with what we hear from U.S. and European officials who have firmly sided themselves with the authorities in Kiev and seem to be prepared to justify and defend whatever action Kiev takes against the protesters. The BBC seriously presented an eyewitness who claimed to have seen someone inside the building try to throw a Molotov cocktail out of a third floor window, only to have it bounce off a pane of glass and start the fire. I shall leave it to you to decide how likely a scenario this sounds. The idea that the Ukraine has a Nazi problem ideological descendants of ultranationalists from the Second World War, isn't then just something Putin is making up to justify his incursions. The far-right Azov Battalion has been incorporated into the Ukrainian military 
and used to fight separatists in the East. Let's listen again to anti-war radio Scott Horton interviewing journalist Branko Martich on this topic. Yeah, I mean, according to this Yahoo News piece, since 2015, the idea is for uh, the US and the CIA to train a, a the homegrown insurgency in Ukraine. Uh, some of the people interviewed don't want to call it that, but others quite outright say that that is exactly what's happening. And and if you looked at some of the rhetoric of, of Biden and, and, and various US officials uh, over the course of this whole Ukraine crisis uh, over the last couple of months, it's clear that, that you know, they've made that threat explicitly. So that is what's happening. You're referring to like uh, the administration officials saying things like, well, if they do invade, they're going to have a really tough insurgency on their hands and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, I think a very thinly veiled reference to, to this program that we didn't know existed. And I think it's it's also not a coincidence that this starts getting leaked just as these tensions are rising and kind of Biden needs to to look tough and needs to to try and, I guess, either threaten Putin or or make himself kind of look like he's doing something on this uh, crisis to stand up to him. Mm -hmm. But beyond the trouble, the inherent problem of training an insurgency and and potentially uh, inflaming a a very uh, destructive and deadly war uh, in that country, which would hurt a lot of people that live there, but would also possibly destabilize things beyond its borders, um, there's there's the fact that, look, Ukraine, since the 2014 revolution, which is a very misunderstood event, uh, very complicated and, and not really well known in the West, neo-Nazis and, and other members of the far right in Ukraine have taken on, I would say, new prominence and power in the Ukrainian government and, and in society. Mm-hmm. There's not only paramilitaries wandering through the country, attacking people and you know doing various bad things. But there's also uh, within Ukraine's law enforcement and military members of the far right have been incorporated into them. Uh, the, the Azov uh, regiment is, is the one that I mentioned in the piece. That's probably the most prominent one. And that's an official part of the Ukrainian National Guard, which is a law enforcement agency. I mean, imagine that. Um, and there have been various far right members in the government. But, you know, in, in this case, my concern is uh, bodies like the Azov regiment and other far right members who we know for a fact, have received military training, who have received weapons. And I think it it would be incredibly uh, fortuitous, miraculous even, if they did not get the training, uh, the CIA training that that I'm talking about here that has been leaked. Because the same year this program began, there was a push in Congress to, when they were sending weapons to Ukraine, Mm -hmm. to ban those weapons and and other military training, other resources, from going to Azov specifically. And according to a report from The Nation in, in 2015 at the time, that ended up being taken out that year because for some reason, the Pentagon leaned on lawmakers and said, well, you know, maybe maybe we don't want this particular clause in there. Let's take right. that out. Uh, so I think to me, that's that's it's a little speculative. But again, we know for a fact that Azov members have gotten this training. And so when you add it all up, there is an above average chance that part of this program is training neo-Nazi violent extremists. It's worth taking a moment to dwell on the wider implications of funding and training Nazis. During the 1980s and 90s, the CIA actively recruited and trained Islamic radicals to use as a proxy force against the Soviet Union, first in Afghanistan, then across the emerging Stan countries, to tilt the board and bring them out of the Russian and into the US orbit. I look at a particular example regarding gas pipelines in Azerbaijan in the Roads to 9-11 series with Adam Fitzgerald. It was toleration of these radical elements that led to terrorist networks nearly bringing down the Twin Towers in 1993 and ultimately succeeding in 2001. Will we see the same with the Ukrainian far right? Again, we have Scott Horton, this time interviewing journalist Max Blumenthal. So in 2004, we had the Orange Revolution. Ten years later, they did it again, only uh, this time they really needed the help of a bunch of Hitler-worshipping white supremacist Nazis to overthrow the government and install the pro-American faction there. Right. Uh, The Azov Battalion has been really essential in holding the line in eastern Ukraine uh, or in the Donbass region. And, you know, what I did in my latest piece, I've written several pieces on it. 
uh, most recently the Gray Zone Project, but this was for Mint Press. And, you know, what I did was look at the evolution of this movement, but also how it's uh, internationalizing. And this should be front page news on the New York Times uh, because an FBI unsealed indictment has accused the Azov Battalion, which has been armed by the U.S. Uh, you know, you called them Obama's Nazis. They were armed under the Obama administration and are continuing to be armed under the Trump administration. The FBI indictment has found that they are training and radicalizing American white supremacists. That's the exact language that the FBI used. And they recently hosted earlier this year a group from Southern California called the Rise Above Movement who participate in the kind of neo-Nazi alt-right in kind of mixing it up with Antifa, anti-racist demonstrators at various pro-Trump rallies. Uh, they were indicted for, you know, conspiracy to riot. And what the FBI did was trace their trail across Europe and found that they were training in MMA and participating in political indoctrination with the Azov Battalion's new political party, the National Corps, in Kiev. And, you know, I looked into this, I kind of followed the same tracks that the FBI was proceeding along. And I found that the Azov Battalion has a very active and potent international outreach arm, which is hosting a who's who of American and European white nationalists and is building ties with uh, political parties in the Baltic states and establishing a Trojan horse into NATO itself. Um, it's, it's just such a shocking story and the, you know, the research, just doing the research was really shocking to me. Uh, and it occurred to me that if these were pro-Russian separatists who were training American white nationalists, this would have been on the front page of the New York times, but so far it's been completely buried in mainstream media. And even the people who cover, you know, white nationalists are basically ignoring this story. By the end of 2014, around 6,500 people had been killed in the Donbass region, with half a million people becoming internally displaced within Ukraine and 200,000 refugees fleeing, mostly to Russia and some to other neighbouring countries. This is the real beginning of the war, not February 2022. This violence led to the signing of the Minsk Accords, first in September then again in a revised form in February of 2015. This agreement lists 13 points which participants are required to adhere to. There is a requirement for the withdrawal of all foreign armed formations, military equipment and mercenaries. I don't think there's any doubt that Russia has provided the separatists with vastly more support than they would acknowledge. It has not, however, been the Russian strategy to encourage the regions to break away from Ukraine. It's likely that Putin thought they were more strategically valuable as autonomous regions within Ukraine, able to veto things like EU and NATO membership. It's also worth noting that the wording of the agreement would technically imply that all US troops and military equipment would also have to leave Ukraine. The Accords also call on the Ukrainian government to dialogue with the Donetsk and Lugansk governments in order to establish them as autonomous regions within the country. This is something they flatly refuse to do, with President Vladimir Zelensky saying he has no intention of talking to terrorists. Let's listen to the Russian perspective on this. And by the way, this clip is taken from Russia Today, so if you're in Europe you might want to close your ears as your government does not consider you mature enough to handle this information. 2015's version of peace in our time. Four world leaders, 16 hours of negotiations, sleep-deprived journalists and a whole lot of hope to finally see the end of a bloody conflict that had claimed 5,000 lives. Seven years ago, the Minsk agreement was hailed as a new beginning and given the final stamp of approval by the UN itself. Like I said, peace in our time. Also, we thought... I think the phrase that the Minsk agreements should be fulfilled is like the Lord's Prayer. Everyone repeats it under any circumstances, but the issue is different. Will the Minsk agreements be fulfilled in the Russian interpretation, or will they be fulfilled as they are? We won't comply with the Minsk agreements under Russian conditions, including the direct dialogue with the Donetsk and Lugansk republics, on which Russia firmly insists. It's our principal position. 
No message could be clearer. A key signatory, the one, in fact, whose country is shattered by conflict, is trampling over the very agreement that could put an end to it, partly out of fear of being branded a traitor by his ultra-nationalist compatriots. But that's why black and white documents exist, you say, to hold you to your word when you think you might change your mind. Kiev says they will comply with the Minsk agreements. Then they say that this will destroy their country. And the current president recently said that he doesn't like any of the clauses. Whether you like it or you don't like it, bear with it, my beauty. You have to comply. There's a lot that President Zelensky doesn't like, and so he hasn't really bothered with complying with the document's 13 points. The ones that have proved the most unpalatable relate to the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Now, according to the 2015 document, these breakaway republics should have been awarded a special status, a kind of self-governance. But Zelensky has big dreams of joining NATO and the EU, and he can't have anyone going rogue and scuppering those plans. Not a single region of Ukraine will receive the right to veto any decisions concerning the whole country. It's undisputed. Thus, there will be no special status. So no special status. A violation. Full stop. No dialogue, in fact, with the Donbass republics. A violation. But there is one fragment of one sentence from one of the measures that Zelensky rather likes, about being handed back full control of the border through the conflict area. Of course, he's conveniently ignoring the fact that that only happens once the republics get their special status. And Moscow warns that giving in before then would be a bloodbath. Ukraine is calling on us all the time to let their troops close the border. But think about what's going to happen next. There'll be a massacre like in Srebrenica. For seven years, Ukraine has shown its lack of interest in abiding by the rules by 13 simple points. So you have to ask, why doesn't it just walk away? Well, here's a thought. The full implementation of the Minsk agreements is the only way forward. Until full implementation is a reality, EU sanctions against Russia will remain in place. It's called cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's called allowing your civilians to be shelled by your own troops while enjoying your neighbor get battered by sanctions. Of course, you'd never know about any of this if you listen to Washington, which, yes, you're right, is not a signatory, but as ever, involved. No, the White House threw out the evidence and found the guilty party long ago. It is a fair assessment to say that uh, Ukraine has sought to move forward uh, on most, if not all of them. Uh, uh, while Russia has made good on virtually none of its obligations under Minsk. Just a reminder, mainly for Antony Blinken, Russia has no obligations under Minsk. In fact, it's only mentioned once in the entire document. It's there, like France and Germany, only as a mediator. Why then isn't Blinken accusing his allies in Europe of not making good? Because they're trying one last time to resuscitate the agreement? Or are they? The situation is absolutely absurd. It shows that almost eight years since the outbreak of the conflict and seven since the signing of the Minsk agreements, everything was a complete bluff. We are at the point where the clock stopped on March the 9th, 2015. Three out of four participants of the Normandy format are not ready to implement the Minsk agreements. So invested, it seems, are the European peacemakers that after a couple of hours of discussion in Berlin, one person present said they had to go walk their dog. A far cry from that 16-hour marathon all those years ago. With the Accords firmly dead, along with 14,000 civilians, you heard how Putin refuses to seal off the border for fear it would end in a Srebrenica-style genocide. Even if you don't think Mr. Putin is a humanitarian, you might still entertain such an outcome would not go down well with his supporters in Russia. In addition to the complete failure of negotiations of Kiev, the other final straw for Putin may have been a complete failure to negotiate acceptable missile defences with Washington. Here's Daniel McAdams of the Liberty Report to explain. You pointed out, you know, the different things that motivated this to happen. And one of those is the, is the letter delivered in December of 2021. And Putin himself mentions that in his speech, the Russians delivered a letter to the Americans, uh, to Blinken, I think it was, saying, let's try to have a new security architecture in Europe where everyone can feel secure. 
And here are the things we would like to see happen. We don't want to have Ukraine in NATO because the, the posing, posting of <clears throat> potentially hypersonic weapons can hit Moscow in four minutes. We don't want that. We don't want missiles put in Ukraine because we feel that it's an existential threat to Russia. And those are re reasonable and legitimate from any perspective. If it was true with Mexico, we'd have the same thing. So the U.S., instead of saying, hey, let's sit down and talk about this because we have some ideas too, basically they laughed in Russia's face. The response was comically devoid of any kind of detail. And I think that was the last straw for the Russians. We tried to tell you, we tried to be able to solve this peacefully without it happening. You laughed in our face. And so now we have, uh, you know, the situation that's happening. In summary then, to return to my original question, what possesses Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine? I cannot refute any of the hypotheses presented, that Putin is possessed by megalomania, a desire to restore the Russian Empire, or a closeted communist wanting to see that ideology spread across the globe. What I can say, however, is that all of these propositions are unnecessary and superfluous. All that is needed to understand Putin's motives is to listen to what he actually says. He believes that Ukraine has no intention of implementing the Minsk Accords, that the humanitarian situation in the Donbass is unacceptable, and that Russia is ultimately threatened by a United States seeking to create a monopolar world order. To accomplish this, they are flooding Ukraine with weapons and training neo-Nazis. Now, if any of these points weren't true, simply Putin's fabrications, then yes, we would have to look for a deeper and more conspiratorial motive to explain his actions. But the Ukraine government clearly has no intention of implementing the Minsk Accords. The US is training fascist militias whilst deploying high-tech missile systems. A glance at history leaves us in no doubt US foreign policy does pursue a monopolar world order, with a strong and independent Russia fully neutered. There is then simply no reason to question what Putin is saying in regard to his motives. It's worth listening to Putin's speech justifying the invasion, not just reading the transcript. To me, he looks like a man at the end of his tether, a man who feels his heels are over a cliff edge, and he has to fight now or watch his country be destroyed. It's my observation that the West has generally viewed Russia as operating from a place of immense strength. During the Cold War, the communist octopus reached out of its tentacles into every non-aligned country in the world. This continuously provided an excuse to overthrow any government not aligned with US corporate and strategic interests. The Russian perspective seems to be more one of survival in a world dominated by a hostile global superpower. There's no doubt that Putin is a Russian nationalist who bitterly regrets the breakup of the Soviet Union and does not feel Ukraine should exist as a separate country. It's a massive stretch, however, to claim that this is the motivating factor behind his actions now. Regarding whether Putin's strategy will work, to me the moral question almost makes the tactical one redundant. Internally, Russia is an authoritarian state where anti-war protesters are currently being locked up. This is not a fight of liberty versus tyranny, no matter how you look at it. At the outbreak of this conflict, I was disheartened to see some of the more right-leaning journalists I have followed through the lockdown crisis instantly falling for all the NATO propaganda. I took heart, however, in reading the comment sections, where viewers overwhelmingly expressed their displeasure and displayed a deeper understanding of events. This is something we can do. It only takes a few hours to become familiar with the basics of the situation in Ukraine. The firmer our understanding, the better we will be able to communicate to others, not even to win them over in intellectual arguments, but simply to show that not everyone who criticizes NATO is a Russian-loving communist or a Putin-loving fascist. I don't claim this will do very much, but it will do a heck of a lot more than doing nothing. Thank you very much for listening. I didn't talk about the factor of a pipeline from Russia to Germany here, or the effects of sanctions, so I may do another episode on those issues. I'll put references in below, and just to briefly recommend Stephen Cohen's book, 
War with Russia, and, as you've probably heard, the Scott Horton Show for an anti-war perspective on emerging events 